Just a note, there is a discussion of suicide in this episode. Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Katherine Garrett. This episode is part of our season on wit, which we are defining as an 18th or early 19th century woman either trying to be particularly funny or clever or teach a lesson. It's a little broad, but I think that this episode is a very nice fit for that theme. This week I am joined by the wonderful early American historian and fellow of the Royal Historical Society of Scotland, Dr. Julie Flavelle. She is the author of When London Was Capital of America and The Howe Dynasty, The Untold Story of a Military Family and the Women Behind Britain's Wars for America. The Howe Dynasty came out last year and it is excellent. It is a great fit for this podcast. If you want your Revolutionary War history from the perspective of the women that it affected as well, it is just very excellent for that. Welcome to the podcast, Julie. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Very happy to be here. So before we dive into the letters, for our listeners who might not be familiar with them, can you give a brief introduction to the male hows? In the United States, the best known male hows are General Sir William Howe and Admiral Lord Howe. And they were the joint commander in chiefs of the British armed forces in the first years of the American War of Independence. But actually, both had served with distinction in the Seven Years' War. William Howe had been under General Wolfe taking Quebec. Richard Howe was famous for raiding the French coast. Some of the hornblower fictional exploits are based on some of his daring do when he was a younger man. They had a joint command. It was unusual to have two brothers as commanders-in-chief of the Army and Navy forces for the first three years of the Revolution. And obviously, they didn't succeed in that. Admiral Howe remains the best-known Howe brother in Britain because he's still considered a hero. He was Britain's first naval hero of what would become the Napoleonic Wars when, in his 60s, he was the hero of the glorious 1st of June sea battle in 1794. If you ask a British person if they've heard of the house, some people who are Napoleonic War enthusiasts, especially naval history enthusiasts, will know about Admiral Howe. General Howe, they seem to have totally forgotten, especially his connection with the War of Independence, which <laughs> is not a very popular topic with the British public. I used to work at the papers of George Washington, so I, I really only know that Howe. <laughs> Yes, General Howe, yeah. And that's hilarious. That inspired the Hornblower series. I used to watch that series. Horatio Hornblower. I love that. I think the author copied some of Richard Howe's you know, exploits when he was a young Commodore and you know, put them into Hornblower's life, some of his, the daring things he did as a ship captain. What inspired you to write this book? Well, the Howe brothers have always been considered mysterious, mainly because they failed to end the American Rebellion. Obviously, the British public expected it to be a walkover. They expected it to be an easy win. So when the Tau brothers came home several years later without having ended the war, conspiracy theories started up. They actually had started up during their command, too, when it was flagging. And so they've always been considered a kind of a, a mysterious pair, and the conspiracy theories have never been entirely dismissed. You know, there are things like that they secretly sympathized with the Americans so they were soft on them, or they prolonged the war to make money, things like that. And the fact that their private family papers were destroyed in an accidental fire in the early 19th century is just added to the sense of mystery about them. But I discovered that their oldest sister, Caroline Howe, left a huge amount of letters that have been almost untouched by military historians. They will dip in on key dates, like battles and things, to see if she had anything to say, but that's it. And it's frankly because she was a woman. And they reveal a great deal about the family. So I decided to write the first ever biography of the Howe family. For historical figures that are sort of well-known because they were brothers working together, it's just so glaring that nobody checked the letters of the sister. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. And they're all siblings. Yeah. And they were a very close family. So tell me more about these letters. Well, the letters are correspondence between Caroline Howe. She was the oldest of the Howe children. She was older than the Admiral and the General. And her very closest friend was Lady Georgiana Spencer. 
who was married to John Spencer, first Earl Spencer. He was one of the wealthiest men in Britain. And she's probably best known to any listeners who like reading historical biography. She was the mother of the Duchess of Devonshire, who has, by now, there's even been a movie about her starring Kira Knightley called The Duchess, if people have seen that. And the two women, Lady Georgiana Spencer and Caroline Howe, were extremely close friends. And they kept a correspondence that went on for almost 50 years. They wrote about all kinds of things, politics, family matters, anything you can think of. It's really colorful correspondence. And it's actually the longest set of private personal correspondence in the British Library. It's reckoned to be. It's never been counted. It was hard work to use it because the letters aren't even foliated. They're just in boxes, box after box after box after box. And, you know, so you just (laughs) have to go through every single letter. They really have been underused. Wow. Were you sort of in the archives, like transcribing as you go? Did you like take pictures and work on them at home? What was your process like? Well, when I started, the British Library didn't allow photographs. They do now. So that you would have to pay them to make scans. I guess they were worried about the documents getting damaged or something. So I'd have to take notes, rough notes, and then go home and then put in an order for PDFs to be made. I think it would have been impossible to use them as effectively as I did without modern means of copying them, just because of the sheer volume of them. And even at that, I mean, there's a huge amount of material that, you know, I couldn't fit into the book. Well, that's what I'm hoping this podcast is a way to talk about some of these letters that are just fun and interesting. And as I said, (laughs) don't always find their way into the history books. So after all of your research and reading so many of these letters that it seems like have been very underused, my impression just from this letter is that this is like a loving communication between very good friends who are sort of sharing their intimate feelings. Does that align with the rest of their relationship? They were actually related in that Caroline had an aunt, Georgiana had an uncle who married, and so they had cousins in common. And so they'd known each other probably all their lives, but they were 15 years apart in age. And they seemed to have become friends in about the 1750s, which is when Lady Spencer really, you know, got married and came into society. And I think that Caroline was like a big sister to her. Caroline was somebody who, very stiff upper lip, but she was very, very sympathetic. And as you can tell from these letters, she had a certain wisdom about her. And that was just what Lady Spencer needed because she was kind of confessional. You know, she liked to gush. And you can tell from the letters, you know, admit how she felt and everything. But, you know, you need to say space to do that. And what's interesting is the Duchess of Devonshire was just the same. She gushed to people as well. So the Spencer ladies seemed to have that. But Caroline was a very good big sister figure, which was good for Lady Spencer because her siblings were kind of needy people. So I think Caroline fulfilled a very important role in her life. And she never got tired of all the confessing. She always said, just tell me whatever you want. I'm sure it's going to do you good. Maybe she'd be a a counselor now. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But they both seem to be drawing these psychological conclusions about things. They're very thoughtful people. Yeah, that's right. You introduced Lady Georgiana and Mrs. Caroline Howe a little bit. Can you tell me, for this specific exchange, what is going on in each of their lives, sort of to set the context of what's going on at this moment? Okay. Yeah. Caroline Howe, who I've I've mentioned some, I should say, there were some dynastic families in the 18th century where the women had a tradition of using what was called drawing room influence to assist the careers of the men. Any woman might use her influence if she was close to a powerful man. But some families actually had traditions of it, and the Howes were like that. She had friends at court. She was friends with most of the prominent Whig magnates. So she was very involved in her brother's careers. And she was also somebody who was very comfortable about entering men's spaces. Like she was the only woman who's listed as a member of the Duke of Rutland's beaver fox hunt in the 18th century. I know people frown on fox hunting now, but in the 18th century, it was the only genteel way for a woman to take serious exercise. But she's the only one listed. Some women did run along with the hunt sometimes. They ride along with the hunt. But she was actually a member, which was highly unusual. She was a very interesting person. And in 1779, her brothers had come home the previous year from the War of Independence, obviously having not prevailed over the American rebellion. There had been a parliamentary inquiry in early 1779 on the conduct of the war, 
with the House Whig allies taking the view that they had an impossible task and the war couldn't be won. And of course, the government supporters saying, no, it was their ineptitude and we have to go on and we'll still win. I mean, sometimes the American Revolution is called Britain's Vietnam. So there's a certain similarity, these arguments back and forth about whether we should just go a little bit longer and you know, maybe it'll all fall together and work. There were also newspaper attacks on the house, you know, massive newspaper attacks on the Howe brothers. So she'd been going through all that that year. Lady Spencer had a very different private kind of problem. Her daughter, the Duchess, was a compulsive gambler. She'd married the Duke in 1774 when she was only 17, and this meant that she could obtain almost endless credit. So she could, you know, gamble and gamble and gamble, but it kind of snowballed. She'd been married for almost four years by the time this letter was written, and the gambling had gotten to be a bigger and bigger problem, and it was actually becoming a source of marital conflict with the Duke. So Lady Spencer had always actually gambled herself. Now, I have to say, listening to the letter, they referred to gambling as play. They used the word play. And she felt responsible for her daughter's problem. So at Christmas 1779, she decided to give up play and she hoped that she'd be a good example and it would help her daughter. And her plan that Christmas was to stay in the countryside. They were at the Spencer seat of Altrop. So if you Google Altrop and look at it, it's a huge palace. It's Lady Diana Spencer grew up there. And she thought she'd be far away from the gambling salons of London. And that's the immediate context for her letter of Christmas Eve, 1779 to Caroline. And I have to say it opens with a friendly complaint that was common between the two women that Caroline wasn't writing frequently enough. For listening, you should know that her nickname for Caroline was Howie. Should I go ahead and read it? Go right ahead. Well, my dear Howie, I cannot help it if you will not write to me. You must let it alone. As soon as you leave off, I shall. Until then, if I can find leisure, I shall continue to write, especially now that I can do it more au cour ouvert than I could while I was apprehensive you might show any part of my letters. For even supposing anybody you show them to to be as partial to me as yourself, yet they might not comprehend some things that I am thoroughly convinced of, and shall make no scruple of owning to you, though I should not care to publish them to the world. The principle of them is concerning what you say, of my seeming to judge it necessary to be out of the way of temptation to go on right. I should be very sorry to find that I could never be right, by which she means stopping gambling, without this precaution, and yet I think the safest way is to suppose it. I should have examined my heart and conduct often to very little purpose if I had not found out by now that I am the weakest of all creatures. You must have seen it forever at play. How often do I make resolutions and break them? And shall I presume after such daily, such hourly instances of folly to aver that I can resist temptation? I know of no good purpose that could be answered by boasting, but of many that may arise from doubting my own strength. It keeps me humble, and in spite of vanity itself makes me feel what an insignificant wretch I am. It teaches me to make allowances for others by showing me how despicable I might have been had my temptations been of the same nature with theirs. And lastly, for this is very sermon-like, it inspires me with continual gratitude to that providence, which amongst innumerable other blessings has by uniting me to the man my heart dotes upon, kept me out of the worst scrapes, and even made my own inclinations my guard. You are, my dear Howie, and I make no doubt with very good reason, sure of yourself. By what I have said above, you plainly see I am not. I must therefore have assistance, and this, in my opinion, religion only can give me. If I had none, I should be like the man who hanged himself only because he grew tired of pulling off his shoes and stockings every night to put them on in the morning. I should be forever trying to mend and finding I did not. I should lose all patience, but far different is the case where there is true religion. The endeavor to mend is in itself delightful because it is attended with a humble confidence that that endeavor alone is acceptable. How much higher then must be the enjoyment if it is attended with success? 
I really feel a great deal and consequently should like to say more on this subject, but I fancy you will have had enough of it. And chapel bell rings, and double the number of Christmas poor are come, for bread and meat, so I must have done. God bless you. The second letter is an excerpt. Lady Spencer to Caroline Howe, and this is written six months later from Bath, the popular watering spa, which all the Jane Austen readers will know. And this is in response to something Caroline Howe said in a previous letter about a mutual friend. This is June 1780. Lady Barrymore knows nothing of me but that I am an idiot about play, and make what amends I can for that vice by being something of a lady bountiful to the poor. I believe these two qualities hang by some whimsical connection together, for since I have left off the one, I think I am grown more callous to the other, and turn a case, a charity case she means, inside out ten times over before I open my purse to it. And the final excerpt is from Caroline, and this was written a year and a half later, Christmas time 1781 to Georgiana. This is in response to a letter that has disappeared. Caroline says, Perhaps you will suppose I am in a disputative humor when you find me animadverting also upon your next paragraph. I agree in the first part, it is infinitely easier to refuse sitting down to play than it is to stop at certain periods when spirits and hopes of winning back eggs one on. But I cannot believe it is a careless indifference of money that prevents your calling in prudence or avarice to your aid. On the contrary, my opinion is that a desire to win has very often, if not always, been the cause of high play, and that avarice is generally already with you at that time, aiding and abetting. Though I acknowledge when applied to you, avarice is not quite the thing, for your wish to gain is on somewhat a different principle from that of most others. What you pick up overnight, you frequently give away next morning. I am not satisfied with what I have said. On the other side, it is something like, but not quite my meaning. But I do not know how to mend it, and shall bid you farewell for this day. That's fantastic. Yeah, they're really interesting. What I found really striking about them, now of course they're written in the context of all sorts of other correspondence over a period of a couple of years between these women. And I think it's interesting that despite the fact that gambling was widespread in Georgian society and elite women gambled almost as much as the men, the psychology of what today we know can become an addiction was totally unexplored. Now, of course, modern psychology wouldn't be born until more than 100 years later in the 19th century. But gambling addiction and its counterpart, suicide, had become widespread in Georgian England by this time. So, for example, Anne Damer was a close friend of the young Duchess of Devonshire, and her son, John Damer, gambled away his fortune and shot himself in an inn in 1776. So, the actual addictive behavior and these desperate measures people sometimes took in response to it were being seen, but there was no real understanding of the psychology behind it at all. Now, Lady Spencer was well-known. She mentioned charities in her letters. She was well-known for her charity giving, and she was also known for having an active religious life. People might know that in the 18th century, it was rather stylish for the aristocracy to be a negligent of religious duties. So Lady Spencer was a little bit unusual in that she was actively religious, and she mentions both of these things in her first letter. She always gave her tenants at Altrop at Christmas time, charitable donations, not only the bread and meat that she mentioned, you remember at the end of the letter, she said the chapel bells ringing and I have twice as many people waiting for bread and meat. She also gave them coats, new coats for the women at Christmas time. And she founded an organization called the Ladies Charitable Society. And this society actually had an historical importance because it was run by women, administered by women, it was the first society ever to use means testing. In the city, in London, of course, anybody who was wealthy had a lot of beggars coming to them, and, and there was no longer any way to tell who was genuine and who was perhaps a confidence trickster or a thief because they weren't living in their own little neighborhood the way they did in the country. So Lady Spencer introduced the idea of questioning these people and even having people visit their homes 
to see if they were for real. So it was means-tested charity, and this became a model for other charities in the future. And she's known for these things, for her religious life and her charity. So it always comes as rather a surprise when people are reading biographies, usually of the Duchess, that Lady Spencer gambled herself, that in fact, she is what we would call a problem gambler in the sense that in these letters, she's obviously trying to give it up. She thinks it's harming her daughter, but she can't give it up. She's struggling. She actually grew up in a household where her mother gambled regularly. Her mother was a lady in waiting to Queen Caroline. So that gives you an idea of how common gambling was at that time. So on Christmas Eve, in the original letter that I read, she's experimenting with staying in the countryside. The whole Spencer family was there that Christmas as usual, together with the Devonshires, the Duke and the Duchess. Now, Caroline was skeptical about this, and she'd written a few days earlier, I don't think being in the countryside is going to make any difference because when I'm in the countryside, I gamble as much as I do in London. But of course, at Altrop, Lady Spencer, as the hostess, had more control. So she was determined to stop the rampant card playing, and she was encouraging ice skating and all kinds of things like that in hopes that people would be doing something healthier. She opened her letter, as you might notice, chiding Caroline because Caroline had been showing her letters to other people, notably to her brother, William, General Howe of Bunker Hill fame. And they both like to tease Lady Spencer. There's definitely a big sister relationship, big sister, little sister there. But Caroline's promised, okay, I won't show the letters. So once the confidentiality's assured, Lady Spencer opened up about her struggle and she admits that she tried over and over to stop. What she'd originally tried before this Christmas was, okay, I'll, I'll tell myself I'll only gamble till I've lost so much and then I'll stop and then I'll walk away from the table. And anybody with an addiction will know this pattern of trying and failing repeatedly is just a fact of trying to give up. And Lady Spencer, in her letter where she talks about humility and being humbled to the dust, she's very open about the loss of self-esteem it's causing her by the fact that you know, she simply can't give this up. And what I found interesting was that she expressed these problems in religious terms. You know, she said, if I had no religion, I'd be like the man who hanged himself because he got tired of pulling off his shoes and stockings every night and putting them on it again in the morning. That may be a reference to a well-known suicide of a member of the nobility that occurred at that time. And the person said he was sick to death of the elaborate dressing for dinner every night. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that's really why he killed himself, but that's what he left people with. And, you know, there'd be this army of servants helping you to put this elaborate clothing on and then take it off at night. What she's evoking here, of course, is the idea of doing the same thing over and over and over till you just lose heart. Well, that line struck me because it's sort of like, I mean, obviously I'm living a very different lifestyle than they are, but you know, the banality of life does sort of drag on. And something like gambling is something that adds a little bit of excitement to that. And she's also talking about religion. So I thought that was interesting is that she said she would be like the man who killed himself for that reason, if it weren't for religion. But is that sort of her technique without, you know, things like studying human behavior and psychology and all of these things that haven't come around yet? She's turning to religion as something that can possibly help. I think that's right, because the psychological reality in this is everybody knows, even if you try to quit something like smoking, you're going to fail. And one of the problems people have coaching people like that is they say you have to realize that you're going to fail before you succeed, because often people fail once or twice, and then they think, well, I can't do this, and I give up. And so she's actually coming at that problem from a different angle. She's saying, I know there's a benign providence who appreciates my just trying. So she's given herself a reward for just trying. She's actually done what the self-help manuals suggest. And I thought that was quite interesting that she's kind of hit upon some of the psychology of the whole problem. So far, so good. But then when we look at later excerpts, we realize she still hasn't succeeded. And the comments she made six months later where she thinks there's a relationship somehow psychologically between her charitable giving, and the guilt over the gambling. She says, I've started to notice that when I gamble less, I become more careful about the charitable giving. I start looking much more closely at these cases and thinking, do these people really deserve this? She says, 
So she actually accuses herself of just the charitable giving being nothing but a guilty compensation for the gambling. She's being very unfair to herself because if you read her letters, she felt very strongly about the suffering of the poor in Georgian England in a way that really is a credit to her and, and many of her peers you know, just walked on by because people were used to the sight of beggars in the streets, starving children and so forth. But Lady Spencer actually felt very strongly about it. But there's no doubt some truth also in what she's saying. And the fact that she's making a tie between, she says, I'm an idiot about play. She says things like I'm wretched and things like that. I imagine that gives you a little bit more empathy of somebody who might like, if she wasn't as fortunate to have access to this bountiful wealth, she could be in big trouble the way some of these people who are begging are. I think it sort of adds a, you know, there but for the grace of God go I type situation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was an interesting character. The reason I thought they belonged together, because I see it as over a period of two years, these women who are very busy with other things. And as I say, there were no self-help books on Amazon for how to kick gambling. It's just the Bible. That's all you got. They were trying to discuss what it is that drives people to gamble on and on. And Caroline Howe comes closest to putting a finger on what keeps gamblers at the table after losing over and over. In a letter, again, that hasn't survived, Lady Spencer seems to have said, it must be that the reason I go on gambling is because somehow I'm indifferent to the value of money. I don't appreciate the value of money. And Caroline disagrees. She's actually sharper about motivation, and she's more self-aware than Lady Spencer. And she gives her opinion that it's much easier not to play at all than to try to break off after losing a certain amount. Yes, she puts it, when spirits and hopes of winning back eggs one on. And of course, she's exactly right, because today, anybody reading a basic advice book on problem gambling, Caroline wouldn't have known any of this, but she was self-aware enough to realize how it all functioned, that there was something in the brain as she put egging you on to keep going. And it's really interesting that although these women and the high society they mixed in gambled frequently, and it really had become a problem. There's apparently, from what they're saying, there's very little exploration on people's part of why they were doing this and what the draw was. You mentioned in your book that Caroline is a, sort of a competitive person when it comes to games. And she played chess with Benjamin Franklin, and she played to win. I think it's too bad that she and Franklin didn't leave a record of who won the most. And I can never decide whether that means one, one or the other, because they both bragged a bit about their chess playing. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, I suppose Caroline wasn't going to leave any written records of the meetings, or not many. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so maybe he lost. That's how I'll take it. <laughs> I guess sort of to add more to the context, you said gambling's a huge problem in sort of this class, but what role did gambling and card playing have in female social life in this tier of society? You mentioned how Caroline was part of, you know, hunting clubs. It seems like women were sort of allowed to participate in more public life through these sort of social avenues. Was gambling and card playing a way to sort of have political influence? It certainly could be. I mean, card playing was pretty much universal as a social activity. And anybody who reads Jane Austen novels will know that, you know, at a ball, there'd be a, a room set aside for card playing. It was just absolutely universal. And in aristocratic private settings, men and women gambled in mixed company. And that certainly brought female Whig society leaders like Lady Spencer and the Duchess of Devonshire into company with powerful political figures like Charles James Fox. And it was a sphere that attracted the leading Whig politicians, many of them, not all. And the women could join them there and you know, have even more contact with them. In terms of attitudes about genteel gambling, Whist, of course, was highly popular. That's what people are normally playing in Jane Austen novels. Whist often involved gambling, but it was also social. It was like an approved form of gambling because you played whist with a partner. It usually was played in a private, quiet environment because, of course, whist involves a lot of concentration and card counting. So it requires some skill. It requires some quiet. And, of course, drunkenness detracted from the play. So this was considered a much more genteel sort of game. By contrast, another game, Pharaoh, that was the most notorious gambling game of the era. And that was a banking game where individual players pit themselves against a banker who dealt the cards. So in that sense, I think it's a bit more like blackjack. And the banker controlled the 
game and redistributed the winnings. Bankers could make a profit if there was a tie or an unusual outcome. So, for example, the politician Charles James Fox operated a faro bank at his private club of Brooks in London in 1781. And it's said that over three months, he made a profit of £30,000, which, of course, is a huge amount of money then. Men like Fox and the Duchess's husband, the Duke of Devonshire, belonged to these exclusive all-male clubs. Now, one of the advantages of these clubs is that the membership was limited, so professional gamesters couldn't get in. And the only people who'd be there would be other wealthy members of the aristocracy. Now, the Duchess, I've said she began gambling and losing at too great a rate early in her marriage. And just to give an idea, she had £4,000 a year as pin money. That's money she could spend on whatever she wanted, nothing to do with food, clothes, whatever, which is a huge amount of money in those days. And a couple of years into her marriage, she had spent most of that by April of that year. She was chewing her nails with fear. She was afraid to tell the Duke. She went to her parents. And Lady Spencer was constantly sending her letters saying, just put a certain amount of money in your purse and don't spend any more than that. And she'd try to tell her which games to play, the ones that were a little bit less compulsive. And it's said that by 1779, the Duchess was in a constant state of fear about her gambling debts. And that kind of remained with her for the rest of her life. That's the lead up to when Lady Spencer thought, maybe if I can quit, I can lead my daughter right. And in fact, just to tell the listeners the denouement to all this, the Duchess didn't recover at all. May 1781, so that's a couple of years after Lady Spencer's effort, the Duchess actually had her drawing room in Devonshire House in London remade into a casino. It was set up exactly like a casino so that it was just like the private clubs the men were going to. She hired professional faro dealers, and there was a commercial faro bank. She was almost moving into being a professional gambler. She was always terrible at gambling. I mean, she did not win. And at these events, some of these shady gamesters could get in, you know, because you could make a huge sums of money off these wealthy people who were just gambling and gambling away if, if you knew how to play the game right. And there was one gamester in particular named Martindale, a diarist wrote this, said he talked the Duchess into an agreement that whatever they won from each other would be doubled or trebled. So for example, if she lost 500 pounds, it would be 1,000 or 1,500. And this man recorded that she ended up losing 1,500 pounds and she was crying uncontrollably. This is clearly somebody with a big personal problem. And sadly, Lady Spencer was seen at this very same event, gambling and throwing her rings on the table because she'd run out of money. But she was never quite in the grip of it the way her daughter was. I mean, she was able to stop. I don't fully understand the psychology of that, but it's a crucial difference. The Duchess just went right off the rails. I mean, she was borrowing money from servants, bankers, hiding amounts of debt from her husband and so on and so forth for most of her married life. Was there any like moral judgment? Was there any sort of like exclusion from society or was everybody just sort of egging them on and everybody was sort of all in this game together? Because it seems like it could turn on a dime of like, well, now you're gambling too much and now this is a moral failing. Or is this just something that they were of a level of society where that didn't really matter? There was a huge amount of public criticism of it. And there were, of course, there were aristocrats who didn't gamble, who sharply disapproved of it. Some of the Duchess's closest friends who accompanied her in all sorts of, you know, not very clever escapades didn't gamble as it happens. They were able to control themselves. The public, there were pamphlets and all sorts of writings about aristocratic gambling and how corrupt it was. Obviously, an incredible waste of money when there are all these poor around. But it was also seen as kind of strikingly unchristian and self centered. And there was actually an equation between pharaoh gambling, that kind of gambling, and suicide, because both of them were seen as having nothing to do with anything but the person involved. So people were seen as being completely antisocial, just totally subsumed in betting at the pharaoh table and or killing themselves, because the two things were kind of connected morally at the time. The last letter seems to be Lady Spencer trying to figure out why she gambles as much we're diagnosing people 200 years after the fact, but do you have any theories as to why she enjoyed gambling so much? In a way, 
I am always reluctant to use psychoanalysis. I think it's a bit dodgy to do that, but you can see in both Lady Spencer and the Duchess these issues with what we would call impulse control, because both women were obsessive about their eating. Lady Spencer ate what would be considered at the time a very eccentric diet, lots of vegetables, root vegetables, eggs, milk. She wasn't a vegetarian, but she tended to avoid meat. This is when, you know, people would eat a steak for breakfast and things like that. And in fact, one of her guests parodied the meals she served, saying the dinners consisted of eggshells and turnip tops. I think that was a joke, but I think it's what today people refer to as rabbit food. Yeah. (laughs) But I think the Duchess really did have some kind of eating disorder. It's difficult to tell. She'd gain weight and then lose weight. She also showed this extreme mood swing behavior. For example, she'd party, literally party until five in the morning. One society gossip described her going out to Vauxhall, the entertainment park, with a boatload of people and staying there until four or five in the morning and paying the orchestra to keep playing three nights in a row. And then she'd just disappear. I mean, she'd basically just go into her bedroom and pull the shades and disappear for days on end. You could guess that both women had these impulse control related issues and that somehow Lady Spencer had more of a grip on it. And her daughter, I don't know whether it was because (laughs) she had such unlimited credit with the Duke, but somehow the daughter seemed unable to control it. And actually, although a lot of her problems are attributed to her unhappy marriage, looking at her stuff, I think it's a little unfair to the Duke. He was a pretty strange person, but she seems to have come with this. She had a lot of problems. And, you know, she was only 17 when she got married. Oftentimes, problems people have manifest themselves nowadays when they go away to college because they leave home, same age. You know, they leave home and suddenly people who hovered around them making things work are gone. And it seems to me that that's closer to how things seem to have gone. I guess maybe Lady Spencer had problems like that. It's also true that gambling was just regarded as fun. And aristocratic women were not, in so far as they might like to be risk takers, they didn't have many opportunities to do it. They didn't go away to war or, you know, sail ships or even hunt too much and so forth. And gambling could be very exciting. And I think that's why Caroline Howe liked it. She was very like her brothers, you know, liked excitement. I would not describe her as a problem gambler. She seemed completely sensible. She had a budget. That was it. But she still liked to gamble for high stakes, and some people complained about it, but she didn't seem to be driven by her habit or anything. I come from a big card-playing family. Not so much gambling, but just competitive just to win. Reading your books and reading this letter, I sort of got a little bit of that vibe from Caroline. It's fun to play, and adding a little bit to something does add that little extra excitement to just about anything. Yeah, that's right. And you could play for very small stakes if you wanted. I mean, it didn't have to be hundreds of pounds lost a night. How would you describe their relationship with each other? The friendship between those two women. I mean, it's really interesting because it shows the importance uh, amongst aristocratic women. Usually when people write about them, they stress the competition for husbands and so on and so forth. But I think they show in a very interesting way how important real friendship was between women in an environment where there was a lot of cutthroat competition, really gossip that could make or break people and so on and so forth. So yeah, it really is a lovely relationship. And this was just one aspect of it. It's been interesting to discuss it at length like this. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. This is a fabulous conversation. To my listeners, thank you very much for tuning in. I will link to Dr. Flavel's books in the show notes. And as ever, I am your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much. Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant is a production of R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. I'm Catherine Garrett, the creator and host of this podcast. Jeanette Patrick and Jim Embusky are the executive producers. The audio in this episode was edited by Haley Model. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to listen to past episodes and check out more great podcasts from R2 Studios. We tell unexpected stories based on the latest research to connect listeners with the past. 
So head to r2studios.org to start listening.